keynote session, uh, closing keynote uh, from uh, Rob Miller, who I think actually is is actually in the United Arab Emirates at, at present, um, but uh, ready for COP28. Uh, so we appreciate him joining from there. Uh, Rob, uh, many of pe many people in this forum will probably know know Rob. He's um, you know an esteemed academic, uh, professor of aerothermal technology. Uh, at University of Cambridge and also the director of the Whistle Laboratory. Um, I think, Rob, you advise the UK government across a number of different areas. You were heavily involved in the, the uh, hugely important Fly Zero project um, and obviously one of the co-founders uh, of the Aviation Impact Accelerator. Um, so delighted to have you with us, Rob. Thanks so much for joining. I'm going to hand over to you and, and really interested to hear some of, it, some of your remarks on this, I guess, the broad topic that we, we've introduced here, which is hydrogen aviation uh, and ha how it can contribute to our uh, tackling of aviation's climate impact. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic, and uh, he hello from uh, COP. I've, I've literally just arrived about about an hour ago. But let me just try and share my slides. So uh, I'll assume you can see them. Please uh, stop me if you can't. Um, I thought I'd talk today about opportunities to raise ambition. So um, a lot of people uh, publish pathways uh, to net zero and they'll have various technologies on them. And those pathways tend to sort of conceptually freeze us in the present. They stop us seeing opportunities. And, and, and we've been looking at modeling in a slightly different way than thinking about a conventional pathway. We've been looking at what you would have to do by 2030 um, to create a sort of tipping tipping points within the system, bifurcations within a complex model. It allows you to bring the time frame of delivering some of these technologies forward. And I'd like to share with you today two of these, which I think are, are quite exciting, that they're, they're a work in progress, but, but I, I thought you might be interested or this group might be interested. So before I start, let me just um, tell you a bit about the Aviation Impact Accelerator, um, what we are and what we're not. We are not the top left. We are not trying to build a fully accurate model of uh, world aviation. People do this with real airline data. They run it on supercomputers, takes months. It can be very accurate. But the trouble is the complexity of these systems sort of trap you in the present. We're doing the sort of bottom right, which is we're trying to build models that maximize the ability to imagine new futures. So they're far more flexible. They take in uh, resources, amount of electricity, amount of water, amount of money, amount of land. Um, they model all the way through the production distribution, the passenger journey up to climate models. And so, so they're not well to wait, they're resourced to climate. And they also have to model other neighboring sectors because the interaction of those sectors with the primary with, with aviation has a first order effect. And we're trying to develop tools, uh, evidence based tools, which can support people in driving change. Um, at the moment, we have one route through the aviation sector. It's the kerosene or jet A route. Um, but as you can see on the right, the possible routes are huge. Any one pathway through that tree, and that's just part of our model, could be part of the solution. And um, the other th issue is that aviation is very technology rich. So if I zoom in on one of those models up, up here, down on the bottom left, the fisher Trops model, you know, if somebody changes the direct air capture module, either its performance, its technology readiness level, its capex, its opex, it can have a non-linear effect on the solution through this. So it really is hard modeling at this scale, and it's a complex system of lots of interacting models with a very large number of pathways. And to cope with this, um, the aviation impact accelerator has, has, has done two things. It's been systematic at the way it collects data, and we have these uh, technology questionnaires that have gone out through the World Economic Forum to deep technologists within a range of companies around the world. And we've, we've brought together experts in the particular groups like MIT, Melbourne, Boeing, Pratt & Whitney, Rolls. And you, you really want to have a range of expertise because no one country or organization 
can sort of do this modeling alone. You really need to bring together all of the best minds in a systematic way to put together such a model. And uh, another very important thing with this sort of modeling that, 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 that we learned uh, about a year and a half ago was that you can't just produce one model because um, the model becomes, uh, if it is realistic of the world, becomes complex. And that means it, the number of users who can actually play with it become limited, That's, they become specialists. And you actually want users to use it. So we now have a, a sort of, we have a, a, an engine underneath, but we have chassis on the top that data mine it. And those chassis are for particular user groups. So for instance, one some of you may hear, have heard of was a tool we built for the Department of Transport called the SAF Mandate Tool. And that speaks the language of policy, but, but connects with the data from the system. Uh, and really allows them to un un unlock change. And we've really gone with this philosophy of different tools for different audiences. Now, um, we launched one of these tools at Farnborough, at the last Farnborough Air Show with Rolls-Royce and Boeing. And at that event, um, Jim Harlman, who was then the chief scientist of the Federal Aviation Authority, came up afterwards and said he really liked the tool. He thought it could be very powerful at helping the FAA develop policy in the US. They said they didn't have anything like it in the US. And could we organize a workshop? So on the left here, you can see this is a policy workshop that was run in Boston, uh, hosted by MIT using the tools. And you can think of it like minority report in a way. Effectively, what the people are doing is playing with the tools and exploring the different policy options. And this had uh, policymakers in the EU from clean aviation. It had DFT, DBT from the UK, NASA, Federal Aviation Authority, and a, and a series of universities. And from that event, we came up with these four areas. And, and these four areas are things that you could do if you were ambitious by 2030, which can cause a sort of tipping point within the system, a sort of bifurcation and can really pull forward your solutions, raising ambition. And so we were really excited. And because the model had originally been, um, uh, had been sort of championed by the, the, the former Prince of Wales, the King said he would like to come to the Whittle Laboratory uh, for a round table at which we would demonstrate these four raising ambition ideas. And he did this as his first act post-coronation, the day after the coronation, uh, with Grant Chaps and George Freeman. And we, you can see there is actually demonstrated some of the models. And I'm going to show you some of those today. And then we had a series of industry roundtables working on those raising um, ambition areas. Now, I'm going to talk about two today. I'm going to start by talking about the unlocking hydrogen transformation um, area of raising ambition, and then the op what we called Operation Blue Skies, about getting rid of contrails. So I'm going to start, before I uh, tell you about the actual scenario itself, I just want to go through a few technologies which I think are key in understanding this transition. So the first one is the importance of redesigning aircraft for hydrogen. Now you can understand this, I've got here a kerosene aircraft, and the dark blue bar is the energy to fly one passenger one kilometer. And that is made up of um, the aircraft mass per passenger, the structural mass of the aircraft per passenger, the aerodynamics, the drag effectively to lift or the lift, one of the lift drag, and fuel tankering, how much um, you have to carry fuel with you on your journey for the second half of the journey. And I've normalized this to 100%. So this is a kerosene aircraft. I think this is a 737. Now, if you take that aircraft and you retrofit it with hydrogen, um, you get this. What happens, as you, I'm sure a lot of you know, um, you can't put the hydrogen in the wings. You have to put it in, in tanks, cryogenic tanks. They have to go in the fuselage. The volume of hydrogen is much bigger than that of kerosene. 
And the result is passengers get pushed off and a lot of passengers get pushed off. So if we look at our bars, the blue bar, the aircraft mass, the structural mass has stayed the same, but the mass of the passengers, so the number of passengers has, has dropped and that pushes this blue bar up. Um, the aerodynamics uh, stays the same, it's the same aircraft. Um, fuel tankering gets better because if you take a, a gravimetric efficiency of, of, of tank at 70%, which we think is reasonable um, in the future, um, and you put that with the hydrogen, it's still only half the weight of the kerosene. So your fuel track can be benefits. You put these two together and you get a disadvantage. And this was responsible for a lot of the myths in the early days of hydrogen aircraft that they couldn't fly long distances. But if you redesign the aircraft, so you change the fuselage volume to fit the passengers in, then um, you find that the aircraft gets heavier, but the uh, because its takeoff weight drops, the, the wings drop slightly in size and the engines drop. And the result is effectively about a balance between the two. Now, if we extend that for range in this diagram, this shows the design system in the AIA uh, designing aircraft over a range from 6,000 kilometers to 16,000 kilometers. It's baselined on the kerosene and the black line is the hydrogen aircraft. Uh, we haven't built any of these obviously, so the uncertainty is the turquoise bar and you can see that's relatively large. Uh, it spans the kerosene aircraft, but um, you can see this downward tilt and this downward tilt is because uh, the tankering effect benefits you as you go to longer range. And so um, it's, it's clear that um, hydrogen aircraft will come into the market at shorter range first, just for ease, but there's no reason why they can't do longer range. And in fact, they have some advantages for doing that. The second thing people, I think, um, quite often miss is they think that liquefying the hydrogen is a disadvantage. You've got to put work in, that's electricity, but that is stored energy. And there's a lot of work going on at the Whittle Lab with Rolls-Royce at the moment on advanced hydrogen cycles using this liquefaction energy in a new type of jet engine. And Pratt & Whitney are doing some work on this at the moment as well. And we think that there's a very high likelihood of the energy per passenger kilometer of flight dropping by 20%. So this really pulls the line down to a real advantage. And, and the combination of these two things really show you why hydrogen, if, demonstrated uh, six, uh, that it can be successfully and practically made has some potential real advantages. Okay, now the next thing I'd like to talk about is the distribution. And one of the Aviation Impact Accelerator uh, group, Dr. Maria Vera Morialis has run a, a really uh, a fantastic piece of work where they've analyzed virtually all the airports in the world. They've data scraped from, from Google Earth that the areas, we know um, the, uh, the, the proximity of roads, of waterways, of railways, and we know the passenger numbers, the types of aircraft, the flights. And so we start to get it, be able to cluster these airports in different areas. And this is a prototype tool I'm showing you here um, that, that allows you to start to explore some of the challenges with these airports. So this, I've chosen Heathrow Airport, and I've chosen now, and it's, it, it wants you to choose where the hydrogen electrolyzer location is, at the airport, maybe central domestic, south of England terminal, or international. And then how you transport it into the airport. Is it piped with liquefaction or is it tankered in? And um, to, to summarize here, you can see that this would take, this solution that I've got down would take 63 tankers per hour going in to Heathrow and 16 gigawatts of energy going into Heathrow uh, to, to, to manage this. So it's, these, these are large, 16 gigawatts compared to 36 gigawatts for the UK grid today. It's a large number. 63 tankers is large, but 100 HGVs go into Heathrow every hour. So. You, 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 you have to do a comparison. Now, where, where it gets interesting now is let's flip to 2050. 
Now, if you flip to 2050, you get a number of synergies. Um, liquefaction, if done at scale, um, we think the energy required to liquefy will go down by about a half. And there's a load of other synergies that come into the system. The advanced hydrogen engines don't burn as much hydrogen. Aircrafts improve. And when you look across the whole system, you find that the number of tankers drops to 30. And um, the energy has dropped a lot from 16 to 6 gigawatts. So you, you, can, you can see the size. And you've got to think in this system's way to see these unlocks. OK, so let's get back to the two op raising opportunities. The first one, unlocking hydrogen. Now, I'm going to use a model here. This is hot off the press. It's a model called Craft, and it's one of our sort of workhorse models that allows you to do all sorts of things from fleet management, demand management, different fuels, aircraft designs. And you can see on the left hand side um, the prediction of the impact of hydrogen. I've switched off. I've switched on hydrogen. Now, this takes a lot of conventional views. The conventional time people thinks it, think it takes to produce an aircraft, a conventional gas turbine just being switched across to hydrogen, current electrolyzers. And you see here that it shows by 2050, really, hydrogen's only going to be a maximum of about 5% of the market, and you can see the electricity use on the right. But if you start to look back through the model, you can see that if by 2030, we had demonstrated a number of core technologies, including the tanks and, and, and a lot of the hydrogen systems, if we demonstrated a, 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 an advanced hydrogen gas turbine that used those liquefaction energies, if we built a liquefier at scale that had half the energy requirements, and if we had demonstrated the ability to refuel at airports at the scale necessary, you get a totally different bifurcation, a sort of tipping point in the system. And it totally changes. You move to the green and you, by 2050, you've got hydrogen um, doing reducing CO2 by about fifth, between 50 percent and 80 percent. So that's a, that's a pretty huge number. OK, so demonstrating these key technologies, there are specific technologies. Other ones are not as important, but specific technologies that if you could demonstrate at scale by 2030, you follow a totally different route through the system. And, you know, this idea that there's one pathway into the future that you see on a lot of these roadmaps becomes sort of, you know, rubbish. It traps you in the future. You can see that you can totally change the direction you move in. Now, quickly at the end, I'd like to demonstrate um, a second one, which is called Operation Blue Skies. And this is about contrails. And the reason I've chosen this one is because there's a lot of concern about move to, moving to hydrogen aircraft and the increased water vapor and the potential for increased contrails. We don't know either way whether it will increase or decrease. And fuel cells, because of their low temperature exhaust, may allow you to have some ability to remove water from the exhaust for periods. So there's all sorts of technology opportunities here. But I'd like to look at the, the potential of removing contrails. So this is a, a picture produced by our partners at MIT, Steve Barrett's group. Um, and it shows the average contrails formed in 2018-19 over US airspace. And you can clearly see the effect of aircraft. They clearly follow the trajectories. The cloud formation follows the trajectories of the aircraft. And these clouds do two things. Uh, they, 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 at certain times of day, they reflect radiation. Other times of day, they trap in heat. Overall, they're a bad thing. The uncertainty of our understanding in them is relatively high. But what's interesting about these contrails is they form when you fly through ice supersaturated regions. And these regions are very large in size, but they're very thin. And that means it gives you an opportunity to change altitude if you know you're in that region, a sort of contrail avoidance system. That will take more fuel burn if you can do it, and it is complex to do. But I just want to give you some uh, analysis from the model to show the effect. So I'm going to start with the model um, showing three metrics for the, for the warming of uh, the climate impact of aviation. So on the left, I've got global warming potential over 100 years. 
So the contrails are a day from the flight and the CO2 is a thousand years. So you have to choose a time scale to average over. And, and on, on the left, I've chosen a hundred years. In the middle, radiative forcing, which is like how many lamps are on, heating the earth up. And uh, this is this this is this this one. And on the right, it's global surface temperature. So those lamps are on, but they heat the planet up, and the planet has a time constant in heating. And and so you can see these results. And in all three of them, you can see the uncertainty is large, the gray area. And that uncertainty is large because um, uh, of the contrail effect. Now, if I split down these effects into the, relative, the different forms of climate impact, concentrate on the red and the blue. The red is the CO2 and the blue is the contrails. And you see the three metrics weigh the two totally differently. So they're not far off the same size. The contrails are a bit smaller when you talk about GWP 100. Radiative forcing, the contrails are two to three times bigger and about twice as big um, with the surface temperature of the Earth. Now, let me finish by just uh, trying contrail avoidance. So I'm gonna switch on the contrail avoidance system. And this uses data that's been produced by trials run by Delta Airways at the moment with Google, uh, sorry, with, with MIT. So they're actually using satellites to change the altitude of aircraft. And I can set the settings that are coming from the trials and watch what happens. It's a huge change. Now, we're, we're, the, the uncertainties involved are large and we have to be careful, but our confidence in an ability to be able to switch off contrails going into the future, I think is relatively high. If I show one more view, so I'm gonna look at the delta now, and the delta over time, the blue is the benefit due to contrail avoidance, and the red bit at the top is the extra fuel burn from changing the altitude of the plane. And on GWP 100, you can see it, but it's much smaller, the red, than the blue. But if you look at radiative forcing and surface temperature of the Earth, you can't see it. And that's because only a little bit of extra carbon is produced, and that has an effect over a thousand years, not over this shorter period. So hopefully what that's shown you is that deploying contrail avoidance technology and monitoring really can have a big effect. And I haven't got time to go into it, but we think that is deployable by 2032, ready to be scaled up. And I think this means that if we can look, I think we have to think differently than than we've traditionally done in thinking about single pathways. When we look at those pathway charts that we see all over the industry, what we're doing is we're trapping ourselves in the present. And what we need to do is within the complex system, we need to think about the actions, the bold, ambitious actions we can do now, which can change the tipping points that can change the whole direction we move through the model. If people would like to get involved with the AIA and the work we're doing, uh, please do. There's an online model you can look at, or there's an email address here to get in touch with us. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. I don't know if you've got a little bit of time for a couple of questions. The first yeah, one, I think, yeah, I think you've answered that. First one was it was a, a, a very quick to the, the punch. Mark Evans asking, how can you get hold of this model and how can you use it? Um, I think you said you're saying that some of the model is uh, available. Um, on the uh, on the website, but you but presumably some of it's behind closed doors. Yeah, so our aim is to have the biggest impact possible. So we're not this is not a for profit thing. We have a model online that you can have a look at. Um, a, a lot of the tools you've seen here are not open. The reason for that is because they you really need to work with experts on using them. So we sort of have a club model if people want to join that they can and uh, you know the, you have to fund some of the core team to work with you but we're, we're really on a journey as a group of partners in doing this so so please get in touch if you'd like to do it so you can either play with a free one or you can actually get involved spend some time in the lab work with the different teams and actually get involved in that process yeah fantastic and then rob this, we've got two interesting questions one from alan strom and uh, one from oliver so in oliver so in the in the 
uh, Q and A. I think asking really about what are these techn- what are the te- technological solutions that can stop you know a, t- a ton of hydrogen producing seven tons of water vapor. So I know you've you've looked at you know that th- this is a possibility because of the low temperature of the of the water vapor in the future from fuel cells in particular. Um, but what what is the strategy for for managing that water? So I, I, so I think um, what I was showing you in that second solution was that I think uh, contrail avoidance systems will scale very quickly. I think they're already happening between uh, Google and American Airways, Delta and MIT. They're getting some good success. We've got Zero Avery in the UK. Um, and I, I, I think there's, there's, there's quite a lot of money coming in from the government. We've just run the Jet Zero Council's task and finishing group on non-CO2 effects the AIA has. And there's some really bold ambitions going to come out. So the question really is, um, will, will contrails really be a significant thing, uh, you know, once you get into the 2040s, 2050s? And I think whatever fool you're using will have an ability to switch them off. Now, on top of that, we don't really don't know, I think, uh, the, whether the extra water vapor involved with hydrogen is going to be a problem. The soot is reduced, which is a good thing, but the water vapor is a much larger amount. Um, and then there is, as I said, the, 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 the idea that if the exhaust temperature is low on a fuel cell, you might be able to store water for periods. I mean, but they're all hypothetical. I don't think anybody's proven them. One of the questions, I think, from for me, Rob, is uh, just looking at the the efficiency gains that you saw from you know changing the airframe. Um, you did. I, I, it didn't. I, did you see any Im- impact from the dry wing? Um, does that create any kind of uh, aerodynamic yeah, differences? That's, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, that's one of the. So in all our studies, we spent Boeing of uh, Boeing spent quite a lot of time with us about a couple of years ago on our underlying model. Um, we decided to leave the wing as a conventional wing, but scale it on takeoff weight. Now, since then, again, Dr. Maria Vera Morales, who has been doing a lot of work on structural design of dry wings, and there is a model being developed. But at the moment, we're not accounting for any um, uh, any potential benefit or problem associated with the move to dry wings. Um, I think the the, 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 the the big problem has been that um, weight limits are fundamental in flight. Volume limits aren't. And volume limits have been honed over a long period of time for kerosene. And people got sort of tricked in the early days of hydrogen to thinking they were fundamental. And, and they're not fundamental. Hmm. Fantastic. Um, brilliant. OK, uh, Rob, I, we, I think we, we ought to kind of wrap up there. Um, it's been I think if you can see from the comments, it's been a, a real uh, great finishing to our hydrogen aviation summit um we'll obviously um be back back next year but i I think lots of follow-up here questions for rob we'll try and follow up and get some answers to some of the remaining ones there um but rob thank you so much for joining us at this late hour uh where you are i hope you're gonna gonna have a have a really good cop if anyone else is is going to be at cop um in the uae we will be there also val our ceo will be there i'll be there for, for a period so Hope to see you there, Rob, and some others. Um, uh, and yeah, thanks so much again for joining us. Uh, Rob, we'll say goodbye to you and I'll just kind of I'll wrap up with uh, just uh, a final statement, really, which is thanks everybody for joining. It's been a, a hugely uh, interesting. I found it fascinating each and every session. Uh, I hope that's been the same experience for all of our audience. Um, Again, we'll be back next year, but just to remind everybody, if you miss sessions, we're going to be putting all of these videos up on our YouTube page um, and we'll publicize that on our social media once those go live. Um, And we'll also try and work through the questions that we didn't get to uh, that everybody posed as we as we always do and post those to uh, to Zero Avia's blog. But again, thank you so much for everybody for joining. Uh, Hugely brilliant audience, uh, brilliant panelists, uh, super interesting discussions. Um, And we hope that there will be a lot more positivity and progression to talk about next year um, when we come back for the Hydrogen Aviation Summit uh, next winter as well. So thanks very much, everybody. Really good to to talk to you all. Uh, Take care. Goodbye.